Hi everyone, I think I'm going to start the session. First, I welcome to who has joined us. We'll see if anybody else joins us, but for now, I think I'll start with introducing Fiona. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Um, would you, just in case, um, and also for the YouTube video, would you mind introducing yourself again? OK, I'm Fiona McAllister. I'm from the CLM Teaching and Learning Unit. I'm part of the division that deals with online you know, and blended learning. I'm, I work with Dr. Greg Krull and my colleagues, Fundiso Nomani and Adriano Giovanelli. So we are a little unit within the Teaching and Learning, learning Unit in the CLM faculty. OK, and wow. I think you can take over now. Thank you so much. OK, thanks so much. Let me see if I'll bring, just bring up my presentation. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. You can, okay. OK, welcome to this session on digital literacy. This particular session is going to focus on, as the slide says, navigating the digital landscape in academia. I'm going to look, be looking at two components of a particular digital framework. Um, and these two, I think, are, for me, form very much the core of, of the, the, the framework, and in particular with, with regard to the academic environment. But, but before we go into that, what I'd like to do is to do a, a Mentimeter word cloud uh, exercise. Um, so if you can go to menti.com and use that code, I'm just going to put it into the, the chat as well. That might be a second. That's the link and I'm just going to paste the code in. I'm just going to stop sharing that. And then I'm going to share the actual mentee. OK, and the question is, what words or phrases come to mind when you think about digital literacy? Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, why is it refreshing? Sorry, my my connection is a bit wobbly. So if I disappear as well, uh, it, it's, it's the connection that's doing some weird stuff. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, basically we have things like internet technology, online safety, Understanding information, that's an, that's an interesting one. That, that, in fact, is something we're going to be focusing on in this particular presentation. And again, information. So, yes, there are aspects there of, of, of what we're actually going to be looking at today. But it's interesting. I just want to get a feel of what people think about digital literacy and what, what, what occurs to people. The online safety is, a, is a, a, one of the things that we will look at probably in a, in a, in a, light, in a later presentation. So... That's where we we're actually going with that. So I'm going to just stop sharing this and go back to my presentation. Thank you for that. Okay. 
Okay, is my presentation visible again? Yes, it is. Wonderful. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so what is digital literacy? Um, there are a lot of, I feel there's been a lot of misunderstanding around this. Uh, it is not computer literacy. I'm, I'm actually repeating, I just want to, to say I'm repeating some of what I did last week because not, not, not the people in this presentation are not necessarily people who were in the previous presentation. So I'm just going to give a very short synopsis of what we dealt with last week. So one of the things I've emphasized is that digital literacy is not computer literacy. And we tend to think about it as simple computer literacy, um, you know, as, as, you know, how to use a mouse, how to use a laptop, how to, you know, use the keyboard, you know, all sorts of things like that. But I think the, the, the understanding is growing as, as we, you know, as we, further we you know are surrounded and entangled with uh, digital technologies i think it's starting people are starting to realize it's, it's, it's more than just knowing how to use the hardware and software um we also generally think of it as what a lot of the first year students do in the the you know that first year experience when they go into the computer labs and yes this is a fundamental foundational part of this it really is a foundational part of developing what we we think of as computer literacy but developing digital literacy but this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. To have the students in the computer lab and you know trying to try, you know training them in terms of the, the actual use of the of the hardware and software, that's one aspect of it. And that is in fact what we looked at last week. Um, what the framework I'm going to be presenting from is the JISC framework. Uh, that's the Joint Information Systems Committee in the UK. They have been working on this for, for some years now. I think it first came out, if I remember correctly, around about 2015-ish, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, there is the American uh, ISTE standards, which is the International Society for Technology and Education. Uh, but there's, their focus is more, I would say, on um, secondary and primary school type of, you know, Things, but they have some valid points in that framework. But the one that I really like to use, which is more focused in many ways on higher education, is the JISC um, Digital Capability Framework, which is actually quite excellent. And they have redeveloped it recently, you know, obviously in the light of, you know, developments in digital technology and, of course, AI. There is one thing, and I mentioned this again, uh, is the digital native myth. Uh, Mark Prensky, uh, created this this idea of there being separation between what he calls digital natives and digital immigrants. Um, the assumption is that anybody who's under a certain age uh, at that time, it must have, that was 2001, but so things have moved on since then. But this particular myth has, has uh, you know, perpetuated that anybody who's young is naturally what he calls a digital native. Anybody, he labels teachers in his particular article as digital immigrants, you know, um, because we weren't born into a digital world. I mean, I, I don't agree with that. I myself, I'm not a spring chicken, but I mean, you know, there were a lot of electronics and things that were, had been introduced even when I was, you know, growing up. It, 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 things were developing just as rapidly, I would say, as they are now in terms of things like, we, I'm referring now more to electronics when I was much younger. But even as I was coming into university, things were starting to move in terms of, you know, personal computers and all sorts of things like that. But the, the, unfortunately, this, this, this dichotomy um, has actually caused quite a lot of trouble because people have picked it up on it and it becomes a buzz phrase and all of these sort of things. You'll often hear people talking about, you know, students as digital natives and, and, and things like that. In fact, in my experience um, over many, many years in this particular field, I, I, I meet people who are retired who are more what you would call a digital native as opposed to a digital immigrant and i meet young people who are definitely digital immigrants so i'm, I'm really really very wary of this sort of um classification and unfortunately is something and I, I i in my travels i hear quite often but which is really something that i think should you know be put to one side because there, there is no you know cookie cutter thing of like okay you know if you're this age you, you do this if you're this age you do that or whatever it might be so I, 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 so I just want to mention this in case you have encountered this digital native digital immigrants it really depends on you know what area you're in how, how much in touch you are with with technology what your interests are are you curious and so forth those are things that that um, are actually factors and the way I feel about this is, is really I'm not very really happy with it I, this is how I feel um, to be very honest with you, this is how I'm feeling about this This still, because as I say, it perpetuates, this myth has perpetuated to a large degree. Okay, re regarding the framework itself, um, there are six components. Last week, in the last presentation, we dealt with digital profic proficiency and productivity, which is what we would have regarded at one stage as computer literacy, but it encompasses a lot more than that. 
Um, basically, just to give a, a synopsis of it, it's the, the confident and the emphasis on confident use of email, web surfing, webcams, video camera, all of the different components that we use on a daily basis these days. Obviously, things like your mobile phone and things like that. Um, again, the, the ability to actually choose, and this is important, the correct hardware and software for a task. So it's not just simply coming up to a piece of hardware you know, and, and using whatever software might be available. You have to discern what is correct within the particular context. You should also be able to troubleshoot, or the student should be able to troubleshoot basic technical issues. And of course, the, uh, the whole um, thing of staying up to date with the latest technology, and we are feeling this pressure now in terms of things like ChatGPT, Copilot, you know, um, Google Gemini, Claude, things like that, all these, these um, generative AI bots, we are now really feeling the pressure to keep up with what's going on and it's, it's developing rapidly. What we, th the next thing is the um, information data and media literacy is one of those things we're going to look at today. The, what we're going to have a look at is the, you know, the collection, curation, organization and sharing of data in a range of formats. Uh, you know, in terms of what the, the skills the students need, looking at interpreting data, uh, digital research, research methods and things like that, understanding of copyright law, then the more the innovation side, creation side, problem solving. Um, this is pretty straightforward in many ways. It's, it's the ability to create digital artifacts, you know, in, in a whole range of formats, including text, images, blogs, wikis, PowerPoint, you name it. That's just a few of the examples. Also, but also looking at problem solving using digital tools. The next facet is the um, digital communication, collaboration and participation. So using things like Teams and Zoom, um, using you know collaborative workspaces such as Google Documents, you also use um, the Microsoft, you know, a Word in Microsoft 365 or any of the other documents to collaborate in a group. And forums, you know, knowing how to approach you know a discussion on an online forum in the chat apps, although that I think is not that that's you know, if you think about something like WhatsApp, and then creating personal digital networks for learning, that's particularly important, those connections that you make with people, uh, you know, in, in digital spaces, which is becoming more prevalent. Then, of course, as we have, uh, it was mentioned in, in, the, in the word cloud, digital integrity and well-being, which relates to, uh, you know, you're developing your and monitoring your online presence footprint and identity, as a, you know, and of course, this is closely linked with privacy issues. And netiquette is still a thing, uh, even though it's becoming a little bit outdated. Netiquette, how you know the, the way you should behave towards others, and you know within particular spaces in in the online environment. And finally, digital learning and development. And then when we come to this particular section, we'll look at digital teaching and digital learning, and you know how how that should be approached from different perspectives, from both the students' perspective, perspective and the lecturers. What we're going to deal with today, as, as I've mentioned, it's these two components, the uh, information and data and media literacies and the digital creation, problem solving and innovation side of things. Okay, in terms of information, data and media literacy, there are three components to it. Information literacy is one. And that, of course, is the, the, the student, how, how this student goes about finding, evaluating, organizing and sharing information. Uh, for whatever purpose. I mean, in our particular area, it's definitely for for academic research or professional purposes. But you know, it it you know it helps to have a broader view. I mean, I think this is why, uh, you know, often we feel that students should be know how to do things. But the way they're using the 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 um, the, the, the the digital technology in this particular instance is not necessarily the way they need to be using it in terms of critical thinking. You know, certainly we all on a personal basis look, you know, go to Google and now of course we're also going to chat GPT and Copilot and places like that. But it's not always sub subject to critical analysis, for example. So that's why, as I say, you know, thinking that people, when you, you know, young people who are using a lot of technology doesn't necessarily mean they're using it in the correct way, particularly for this information literacy side. It's something that I found in my travels, again, I found it rather lacking in, in academic, you know, um, environments that students don't know how to do this. The next is data literacy, and that's, of course, how you handle the data, how you, um, you know, how you, how you manipulate it, how you present it, and all, and all those sort of things. And it, it goes together with the media literacy, which is the next, um, component and that covers the way that you receive and respond to messages for example in digital media um, but it's it's also to do with how you actually create it but it's it, it does cover this portion where you you know it's how, how you how the, the the message is presented how you receive it but also when you're creating it how, what how do you think that person will receive it okay before I launch into the um, the, the aspects you know that are around both of these topics I would like you to keep in mind as we go along, what does it mean in your particular context, your specific topic, your specific subject? 
And how do they encounter practice and get feedback on these aspects within your particular subject? Um, you may already be doing things. You may this may be you know generate some ideas, but it's just to get the general idea, just to contextualize that that the that the framework I'm going to present within your particular space. Okay, let's look first at information literacy for students. Now, what the um, JISC does, it, it, it divides things up into levels, um, not necessarily for every um, particular component, but it, in this particular instance, we're first going to look at the basic, what they should know by the end of year one, then we're going to go move into a sort of, as they move through the degree, and then towards the end. So end of year one, this is very basic, using a search engine, um, and also understanding inform that information sources have different value and credibility, and I think this is incredibly important because Students are not questioning, even if it's not digital, I think we, we are aware that students are, are not really questioning, critically questioning um, some of the, the, the materials that they are given or the, the, you know, the readings they are given and so forth. But even more so, it's important in the online environment where there's, a, there's this huge deluge of information, the, the ability, particularly in your own subjects, the ability to actually discern what is useful, what is not useful, what is possibly fake these days as well. We've got to look out for things like that. Um, and then also the ability to organize digital information using files, folders, moving through. Oh, sorry, I don't know why that, where that came from. But the ability to use um, you know, files and folders to manipulate it uh, as you go. Um, moving to, I don't know why, I apologize for that mistake there. Then as they move through the degree, again, they are using search engines and catalogs, the databases to find relevant, hopefully, to find relevant information, including scholarly and professional information. Um, again, now that they develop a deeper understanding of, of what you know, what type of information is it? Is it credible? Um, you know, and what what is the relevance of that information? This is where we go deeper into it as, to their specific task. I mean, is it valid? Is it valid information? And then again, managing the different types of referencing software um, and reviewing information for their study. You know, tr actually collating things to a certain extent. This will this will um, you know. There are other aspects of the framework that this will also speak to this, but that is very important using things like EndNote, Mendeley, and, and things like that. I mean, it's also part of the, the productivity side of computer literacy. Um, and again, very, very important. Um, the ability to, to, to understand copyright and very few students, I think, unfortunately, understand those particular components. Um, this is something that is, is 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 really really important, and I think it's something we, we don't always we try try our best in terms of uh, you know things like plagiarism guidelines and and all that sort of stuff to have a really good understanding of copyright, um, and only using you know legal sources and sources that they are able to use. So that it, it is a much 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 larger um, concern and uh, uh, you know a topic of focus, if I can put it that way, that we really need to have a look at. And then also sharing and presenting information appropriately in the study context. So, you know, again, speaking to a specific audience, um, the way that the actual subject matter needs to be presented, the format and so forth is so understanding that as well. Then you, when you move to end of degree, um, then in this, they are now, I would say, I mean, for me, some of these things are, there's a bit of a, a hazy you know, sort of like gray area. They, they really speak to each other, and I think it's not necessarily just at the end of the degree. So particularly as they get into the higher levels of the degree, they should be able to find information using a variety of search engines, indexes, and databases. And this is something I mentioned it in the previous presentation that I found is, is a bit of, bit of concern, because um, I'm again going to mention the example I've experienced, and I've experienced it here and there in other places as well, where I was doing a presentation to five master students and a PhD student, and the five master students couldn't did, did, didn't have a clue how to use the databases, the library data, you know, the, the databases that the library has access to on EBSCOhost. Um, I actually then had to give them a little tutorial on on how they work, and that really worried me. These were postgrad students. The PhD student was fine, but the master students didn't have a clue. And this was quite far in, into the year. It wasn't the beginning of, of a, a, you know, a, an academic year. So that is something I think that really does need attention. And I think the, one of the ways to do this is to really just give students a small exercise in, in, you know, going and looking for something. I'm not sure how it is in the health sciences, but as I say, on my, my, my travels, I've encountered this again and again, where you find, and even students have given this feedback, you know, if you ask them, when well, how, you know, how do you find your data? They don't really not only mention things like these databases, but it's just something, as I say, I want to highlight. 
Um, finding the information um, within digital files, editions, collections of examples, searching, browsing, skimming, skim reading, all of that sort of thing. Um, critically assessing whether digital information is trustworthy, again, timely and relevant. Again, it's that idea of fake news, fake uh, data, all that, that sort of stuff, uh, which hopefully by this time they will have honed the ability to, particularly within a subject field, to actually assess the, the, the information sources that they, they encounter. And again, I mean, this is, goes without saying, the use of appropriate referencing. Uh, for digital, particularly AI. That is another thing that um, we, we need to look at. Um, in our own guides, the CLM guides, in terms of, you know, for the students, we give them examples of how to cite, you know, how to reference and tell tell the lecturer, I have used, for example, chat GPT for parts of this. Can you hear me? I've just had a thing where it says I'm on, I'm on hold. Uh, we lost you for a sec, yes. We did. Yeah. I heard that horrible little tune that it plays when, when it does that. Okay. So, yeah, this is in concordance with, you know, as, as they move. But a lot of these things really have to be integrated in some small way even in, into the curriculum. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. That's something I want to emphasize and which I always emphasize in terms of digital, um, you know, online and blended blended learning. It's not something that's going to happen overnight, but these are definitely things we need to, to think of in terms particularly of the information literacies, because this is one particular area where there is quite a weakness. I don't know if you have a, a different experience in health sciences, but this is where there's a there's quite a weakness um, that we have actually, you know, pinpointed. Okay, in terms of data literacies for students, these basic skills um, know what kinds of data, and I think this goes without saying, particularly in the academic environment, are used in a, the subject area. And in what form do you know will you find them? Are they spreadsheets, databases, archives, and whatever it might be, uh, books even, you know, things like that. Um, understand the risks of, and also here we go. This is where we we have the, the, the we're sort of delving a little bit, even though we're not in the in the um, the sort of online um, safety aspect. The risks of sharing personal data, and you know how to protect it appropriately, particularly also in, you know in, in with regard to research and ethics and things like that. Um, but also in terms of, in, uh, you know, AI at the moment, um, one thing that needs to be emphasized to the students, if they are using a, a, you know, one of these generative AI bots, then they've got to be very careful what they put into, into them, particularly if it's not within, for example, the WITS environment. We use Copilot now um, in the WITS environment. That can be found at copilot.microsoft.com for those who may, may not be using it yet. And that particular, uh, if, if you sign in with your VITS uh, sign-on, then that information is protected. So what will happen is you'll 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 query the you know the the, the bot and you know you'll have a conversation and prompt put prompts in and get information back, but none of that information is kept. Once you have finished that chat with the bot, it it is deleted. There is a disadvantage to that in that sometimes you would obviously like to keep your chats with the bot, you know, for reference. But that you, you will need to actually copy and paste the data into an into another application so that you know but it, it, it is helpful in terms of knowing that it's ring so, so called ring fenced there's not nothing will go out of the university you know particularly but i'd still be very 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 cautious of, of submitting any sort of um you know original research and things like that i wouldn't be too happy i'm still not happy to do that even though it's it's protected okay as they move through the degree um obviously Accessing, they know how to access a variety of subjects, and this goes back to the databases, um, a variety of subject specialist data, and also use data to solve problems. Now, I think this is inherent in medicine. I mean, you a lot of this stuff, I think this is these are skills that medical students hopefully are, are developing on an ongoing ongoing basis, you know, using data to solve problems, visualizing solutions, and um, you know, being able to support subject specialist tasks, things like this. A lot of this, I think, in, uh, this is something that occurred to me as I was developing these presentations. A lot of this is actually, in, you know, inherent in, in in medicine. There's a lot of critical thinking that's needed. You know, different sources of information that that they have to analyze and and collate and, you know, you know, put together put together the, the pieces of a puzzle. But in, in any case, at the end of the degree and professionally speaking, that ability to analyze data, and particularly to produce um, data visualizations and reports. But again, there there are there are different ways of doing that. Um, how it's, it's done understanding how the data is used, you know, to construct arguments and cases. Um, that 
in fact, I mean, medicine, obviously, you know, you, you know, you are able to interpret, interpret, just to be interpret the data, um, you know, in terms of, of, like, let's say, you know, blood tests and things like that, you know, that's, the, I mean, that's why I say, I think it's very much inherent in any way in, in medicine. But again, following ethical, legal and security guidelines, and these are this is the ethical side of things, particularly in research, when recording, accessing, managing and using data, you know, making those declarations that this is how I'm going to, you know, you know, secure the data that I'm, I'm recording from you or whatever it might be. And again, this again is something I think is or should be intuitive is making those um, informed and ethical choices around the, the, the data that you are getting from from other people. Um, or you're encountering in the online environment and, you know, should you share it, shouldn't you share it and things like that. There's a whole range of aspects to that. Okay, now moving on to media literacy. Um, the basic skills for this. Uh, making sense of messages in a range of digital media for text, photos, graphics and animations. So this is actually quite, it's quite interesting because this is where the, the sort of like a multidimensional aspect comes in. Video, audio, multimedia any, and hypermedia is the web. Um, actually making sense of it. I mean, messages are pre presented in different ways, in, in, di in different, you know, environments. There's different combinations. So it's actually being able to, to synthesize all of these different, uh, you know, it's a different, slightly, we have been talking about the synthesis and analysis. It's a slightly different way of looking at it. Um, and then the, the access and navigation of digital media in different formats and using different devices. So, you know, in terms of the type of media that's produced, because we have such a rich, um, selection of media now, now you know, especially as things have developed on the web, and you know, there's, there's, there's so many different sources and so many different ways they can be tied together. So that's part of what the, the media literacy, and that's the basic level of media literacy. Again, moving through the degree, um, see, as you can see, again, we're assessing the value and relevance of digital media for specific tasks in a study context. You know, in in an, you know, actually demonstrating something, um, clarifying something. It, 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 it's, it's a nuance. We have been looking at these things, in, you know, from, from you know, in, in different in in the different types of competence, but it's, it's, it's sometimes a little difficult. I think there's sometimes a little bit of a gray area, as, I, as I've said previously, between you know different ways of look. They sound very similar to each other, but there's a slightly different perspective to them. And also then the sharing, curation, and referencing of digital media in a study context as part of a presentation or discussion, particularly referencing. Um, and then the repurposing, reuse, and remix of digital media with an understanding of copyright issues. Now, what this refers to is what we call open educational resources. In the main, that, that repurpose, reusing, and remix is very much part of the Creative Commons approach to, you know, sharing uh, information, you know, outside of your particular university. You can choose a specific license that allows people to reuse it. And sort of rejig it and, and put it into their own, um, you know, like black like contextualize it in their own environments. And I'm sure you've seen those little gray and black and white. Um, I should actually have given an example here. Little the, the little um, how can I put it? Little graphics that that show you whether it's you know you can use it, um, reuse it without any constraints. There are other things where it's almost like traditional copyright where you can't alter it. And you know you, you have to leave it as is. You you can't you take it and use it and then you know edit it and do, there are different levels. But that's what it it means. But also in terms of you no, know, don't reuse something if it's fully copyrighted and then sort of claim it as your own. Again, we're talking we're speaking to the whole idea of plagiarism and so forth. And then also the risks in engaging with and responding to digital media. I mean, again, we're talking about fake information. I mean, so, you know things are are you know it's the ability now to with AI to generate. Um, fake graphics, fake videos, and so forth. Admittedly, it's becoming very difficult. It's becoming really, really difficult to do this. But they, these are the things one needs to bear in mind. And then end of degree. And again, here, there's this idea of the media literacy of how to interpret different types of, of messages and how they are created in order to appeal to, to, you know, to focus on a specific audience type. And particularly that idea of developing that the literacy around professional communications, you know, even in terms of, you know, the combination, how you will do it in terms of combining textual, visual, and so forth. And of course, you know, just the audience itself, you know, does it speak to the level of the audience and so forth? Um, and you can also, and also they are at the, being able to critically look at something else and judge whether it is, it is actually um, what you're looking for for that particular audience. Again, here, 
the most obvious one, and this, this goes with the next in the innovation and creation that we'll look at next, being able to produce a range of digital media content using the various types of tools. Not everybody, of course, will develop this. It depends what sort of area you're in. But it is good to have a basic knowledge of, although they, they, they've, they've put this at the higher level, of actually producing media in different forms. Because sometimes it is, it is easier to produce something that is more visual, you know, in order to explain something to people rather than something textual. And, you know, being able to do that is particularly, you know, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so easy now with all the different types of apps that we have that, you know, assist people in this. And then again, it intersects again with appropriate referencing and acknowledgement for digital media specifically. Um, so again, you can see this, the, you know, there's an interlacing of this with normal, you know, as we looked at information literacy and so forth, there's, there's interlacing. They do, as I said, they take it from different points of view, coming in from different, you know, in, uh, kind of like different aspects of it. But again, the referencing there, and then choosing how to participate in digital media. And how you, the way you, what you create, how, how that influences others, um, especially in a professional space and things like that, has to be very, very careful. I mean, you can be, have a very positive thing where you're reshape, as I say, reshaping social, cultural, and professional life, but you've got to be careful. There are, there are pluses and minuses to that. So those are some aspects. Now, I'd like to ask you a question. How do you, I mean, some people may already be doing this. How do you, or would you integrate these skills into the curriculum? You can, uh, you know, use the mic, or you can, uh, you know, put a comment into the chat. Because I am interested to see if people are, if there's no right or wrong answer here, I, I'm just interested to see whether people are or aren't integrating some of these things. I think in I'm, my assumption is, and, and perhaps it's wrong, that, you know, some of these skills are inherent in the medical sciences in terms of analysis and using different, you know, types of, tool, you know, technological tools and things like that. But I'd be interested to hear what people have to say. some reflective types of activities. And I'm assuming that it reads like a stereotype comment is to do with the uh, digital natives and digital immigrants. As I say, there is no there is no right or wrong answer here. It's just a question of, I'm interested to see what people are thinking or feeling um, you know, in terms of, of of this, looking at all these different aspects, one of course has to have the entire picture. But this, these these are, as I say, there's a there's a there's a, a sort of you know, they're, they're all pretty much enmeshed with each each other, even even though they are taking things from different points of view. Okay, go back to my presentation. Okay, now generally, just are there any thoughts, ideas, or not specifically to that question, but any thoughts, ideas, or comments that have been stimulated by these this particular, these this you know, focus on, on the information literacy, data, and media literacies? Any thoughts, ideas? Um, hi, it's Stuart here. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to, I, I found in doing, in research, in doing my own research and then supervising students, it's mm -hmm. often when suddenly you need to write a section in your proposal about how data will be managed and looked after mm -hmm. uh, that people suddenly come up against that being one of the more difficult things to get right, especially in the mm -hmm. ethics application, because yes. I think people are unsure of what uh, secured, how to secure data, how data should mm -hmm. be processed and managed and transferred and what the safe ways are to transfer. So I find um, often we don't realize what our gaps are until suddenly Yes, uh, the yes, ethics committee yes. gets back to us saying we need a clearer data plan here, and I think it's something that a lot of us have struggled with. Yes, I'm sure. No, it, it is it is something that that you you know how do I secure it? Because there are many ways of doing it. I mean, it's obviously you know putting it on a secure platform, but then you've got to tell tell people how you're going to keep it secure on that platform, even though it is secure. You've got to use passwords, and you've got to do all sorts of things. Um, I know there's a there's an inherent suspicion around I think trying to store data, particularly in the online environment. I don't know if you found that. Um, you know, it's, 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 there's, 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 I don't think people are convinced that you can keep it secure. I mean, nothing is 100% secure, but I know what you mean. It is, it's difficult to actually justify how and, and give them an, an explanation of, you know, I, I mean, I'd be interested, what, what, what were they concerned about in that specific instance in the feedback? What did they, they say? So a lot of it is uh, because I do research with uh, uh, 
uh, qualitative research with participants mm. that need to share things like audio diaries or you're recording interviews. Okay. Yes. And then you need to do data analysis in a collaborative way with people mm. that are remote. So you need a certain degree of access to the data mm -hmm. uh, and you need people to be able to share what is effectively their own data if they record an mm -hmm. audio diary or something like that. Mm -hmm. yes. Share it with you in a secure way, mm -hmm. but then also make sure that then for something like the data analysis or something, you can give access to the right people, uh, you know, and once mm -hmm. you've, you know, you know, anonymized the data and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of it is how the data moves from one place to another from when the student records it to how do they send it to you to where do you store it mm -hmm. until it's anonymized and then how do you share it so i think those things it's often that they want very clear steps on how the data how is going to be managed to through all those steps mm -hmm. to to f be able to collaborate but also uh, maintain the confidentiality of the participants yes and rightly so of course what was the solution that you found to that what what were they happy with so there's interesting discussion about whether if the student one of the interesting things was the the student turning off uh, apps that automatically sync things, being mm. aware of who's recording things in the yes. background, because I think people aren't exactly. aware of what various apps are storing to to clouds and stuff like that. So, for yes. example, the audio recorder on an Apple device automatically syncs backs things up to to the iCloud and things yeah. like that. So, and mm -hmm. then it was a case of, you know, creating uh, again an online drive that only you and the participant have access to mm -hmm. and then transferring that to another online drive so it was actually land up being like a multi-step process yes um that they they were eventually happy with but it's interesting to think about i don't think we have that knowledge about what is actually safer like is email safer than a hard drive safer than a cloud mm -hmm. you know i don't think we have that knowledge about mm -hmm. i mean even the cloud i mean i i personally trust if, for example, I upload something to Drive, to Google Drive, and I, you know, I have a folder and I password protected and all that, I'm, I'm assuming that it is as secure as I can make it. But you never know where that data, you have no control over that data once it's on that platform, you know. And it's these sort of things that one has to, I mean, you, you can only do so much. But uh, I mean, I probably shouldn't be putting doubt into people's minds, but I'm just saying, you know, you can make it as secure as you possibly can. Um, but it is important. Thanks, thanks for that example. It's it's very interesting to look, listen to all the, the the hoops that you had to jump through. And but as I say, rightly so in terms of confidentiality, you know, um, of of people's data. Thank you for that. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next section, which is digital creation, problem solving, and innovation. And you will, as I keep saying, notice some similarities with what has gone before, but it's again looking at it from a slightly different perspective. I mean. Basically speaking, digital creation is, is about digital production of content, you know, in terms of videos, text, combos of text and video, graphics, graphs, text, back graphics, still graphics, video, whatever it might be. There's also that digital problem solving aspect, um, the student's ability to solve problems, make decisions and answer questions. And then digital innovation, which describes the student's willingness to try and, and, and all of our willingness to try new practices and look for solutions with this digital technology. Again, as we go, keep in mind, what does it mean in your context and how do learners encounter and practice particularly and get feedback on these aspects within your particular subject field and how it can be in, you know, in, 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 you know, in integrated into the curriculum. Okay, digital creation, it is what it says it is, but in, you know, in a very lower level, a lower level, it's the basic editing skills appropriate to a specific particularly, and they constantly contextualize it in terms of the subject that you're dealing with, and the ability to produce basic digital content. Again, written documents, presentations, posters, and again, this is go, but again, if you think back to media literacy, you're bringing in those aspects of media literacy, how to do it, what not to do, how things will come across and so forth. This is what's going on in the back of it. That's why all of these, although I'm presenting them separately, they all integrate. In terms of, now that's interesting enough in this framework they didn't do a moving from basic to end they simply give end of, end of degree in, but i would say that this is in this is during and end of you know Produ okay producing range of digital, digital media content relevant to scholarly professional communication again for example as we know presentations posters is another thing in terms of conferences infographics um you know different types of text digital and multimedia videos all of these things screencasts and so forth um and it says there specifically, see media literacy for tools. So we've just looked at that whole media literacy, you know, in terms of, of, of what, again, it, may, it, it, it integrates with it. Um, designing and producing digital solutions to creative scholarly, and it said, you know, different types of solutions. For example, you know, producing a design, um, particular artifacts. This is like the end product narratives, 
all these sort of things. Some of them will not apply, obviously, in your in some of your areas, but it, also learning materials. And that's something to keep in mind in terms of open resources that maybe you can you know, put out there under, for example, a career, you know, these open licenses such as Creative Commons for use by other students. So, you know, using in terms of doing this, you know, in your particular subject, you can get students to produce, a, you know, an artifact on a particular subject, if it's relevant, of course, and then they can then share that more widely outside the university. I mean, first of all, if it's a very good piece of work, it will boost the university's, you know, you know, the impression of the university, but also it will be of help. And that's this is the primary thing is to be of help to other students. If the student has produced something that will definitely be of help in a particular subject. And then understanding how digital design is influencing the subject area. So there's definitely that interplay between the technological development and how the subject field is developing as well. As we've seen, the the uh, I must say the, the 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 hot topic, of course, at the moment is generative AI. That that is really starting. It's going to shift the way we do things in teaching and learning. It, it definitely is because we now have um, students having access to something that will write. Uh, an essay for them that will produce an answer whether it's right or wrong of course is another you know a whole other ball game and in fact was we were having a meeting this morning about you know the ai marking things do, do, doing marking and stuff like that and you know when we actually ran certain certain um questions and answers and things through the this particular it was co-pilot we ran it through it would come up with different answers every time you know there's 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 no um how can I put it? You know, I think the words redundancy. There's, there's, there's no, there's, there's no, um, you know, it doesn't come up. You know, no matter how well you phrase something, it'll come up with different answers every time. I found that myself just in my own. You know, I'm giving a particular example of something we were discussing this morning, but it, it, it it's not reliable. And the students, don't, we need to get the students to understand that it isn't um, reliable. You know, in terms of, you know, it produces, it's producing something, it's creating something. But it's not necessarily what you're looking for, and that's of course where the critical analysis, you know, there's being able to critically analyze a piece of information, but then couching it within the learn, like for example, a learning outcome. Um, you know, this is one of the things we, we, I, and well, many others across the world, you know, being in in digital education and things like that. One of the techniques, as I'm sure you're all aware, is of getting the student to use the generative AI, bot, whatever it might be, Copilot, ChatGPT, whatever they're using. And then to critique that answer, because at the level we're at now, in my, in, in my own you know, experience, admittedly limited, the answers it gives are not correct. I mean, it's slightly better than when ChatGPT first came out, but it's still giving some really dodgy answers. And I think that's one way of developing that critical thinking for the students is that you give them a question, get, get them to go and you know generate an answer, and then all come together and each person will probably have a different answer and not all of them will be correct. You know things like that. That, that. That's the way we're actually looking at it. For, you know, for the moment. I mean, there's certainly developments we have to look at going forward, but that critical analysis. Okay. Um, the research and problem solving. I think most of these things we are doing anyway. You know, again, finding and curating digital information to inform decision making and problem solving. Um, the way you you know you utilize the data. I mean, we do this. This is an academic. Uh, you know, the, the here, focus here is academic, purely academic. This, this is what we do. Accessing and gathering the relevant data in different forms, um, you know, and then collecting and recording original data using here. We, this is what we've just been talking about. Um, and then relevant to the subject area, the ways you can record it in, in particularly when the subject area, but also, um, you know, collecting the data that, that Stuart was talking about, you know, in terms of uh, for research and things like that. Towards the end of the degree. The selection, prioritization, and interpretation of data, primary or secondary, to answer original questions and solve problems. I mean, this, this, these are things we, we are doing our best to you know, develop in students. Again, make, you know, coming to a conclusion or making a decision based on digital data and evidence. Again, thinking back to the other aspects of, is it the right information? Is it correct? Is it fake? Is it, is it just thrown together some sort of, you know, even Google, has it just thrown, you know, brought up the, the, the correct you know, type of information you're looking for? And then the collection and analysis and um, using appropriate professional methods and, and awareness, as we have said, of professional data ethics. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier. And then assessing opportunities and risks, benefits and harms from specific. And, and again, there's that thread that's coming through again of, of you know, what it has produced. Is it what it should be? You know, is this correct within my specific subject? Is it ethical? Whatever it may be. <clears throat> 
and then digital innovation. Um, here, really, it's more about adopting and trying out and all of those sort of things, trying out different types of, of applications and approaches, maybe in a novel way in a particular subject field. You know, exploring beyond the basic functionality, um, and the, and, you know, just being willing to see the possibilities within a, a particular tool. And, and, you know, sometimes in teaching, you, you find people using things in innovative ways, particularly things that maybe they were not intended for. I wish I could actually think of a particular example right now, but it's just, you know, it's only through the use of these, you know, and experimenting with them that you will actually, you know, that's, and this is something that needs to also be encouraged, you know, the students must be encouraged to do, is to go out there and look within a particular subject field, particularly, how can you use this tool in an innovative way, particularly in, in, in teaching and learning? You know, how can we use it in order to, you know, maybe explain something a bit more clearly to a student or demonstrate something more clearly, whatever it might be. Okay, and then end of what I, as I say, I feel this this is a thread. It's not just end of degree. Um, to be able to, and this is quite a, a, I think, quite an important skill to be able to actually describe how the digital technology is changing, or might change your specific study or professional practice. Now, this is something I think that I, I mean, as I say, I'm naively assuming in in you know in medicine, for example, in health sciences, there are there are developments, rapid developments in in different fields, in terms of of um, treatments and so forth. But I mean, it is something that you, one definitely needs to think about is like, be aware, um, even outside of your subject field, of how things are influencing uh, your particular professional practice, or even, even study or research or whatever it might be. Um, and be able, be able to generate new projects, challenges, ideas based on that understanding. That is, it's that, it's that building on that, that, that understanding of how things are changing and how things can be used and so forth. And then also choosing you know, new digital applications or put them to use in an area of study or professional practice. And, and again, I'm going to go back to AI. That is, we've got to think of innovative ways of using AI because my, my, my experience at the moment is everybody wants to jump on the plagiarism bandwagon with this. It's like, how do we stop the students from using chat GPT? We're not going to stop them. That's the thing. We are not going to stop them. We need to think of innovative ways of integrating it. And as I say, one of them is the critical analysis. It's quite a well-known um, example now. But it's something I think we need to bring bring into it. And then, again, I'm asking the question, how do you, would you integrate these skills into the curriculum? Just to generate ideas of, of you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not expecting you literally, if you want to, you know, to, to respond to it, you can in the chat or by the mic. But it's just to, to, to place this within your context and think, is there any way that we can introduce this? And as I said, it does not have to be some great project of introducing massive changes over a short period of time. It's it's incremental. It really is incremental. It's a slow change. Trying one thing, maybe it won't work so well, try something else. Um, but I really do feel strongly that we we need to start integrating particularly AI into, into the curriculum, the ways in which students can use it so that they can see it's not just a quick fix. This, you know, Let me just go to chat GPT and get the answer for this. Uh, the lecturer won't know that I'm using this for for whatever purpose. For them to actually critically analyze, you know, that, that and, and see it in action, in and used in the correct way. I think that's that's incredibly important, rather than just letting them go off into the the wilderness and, and use it. And like, how can we catch them out in the way that they're using it? it, it we really do need to think of of bringing it in into the curriculum and in, into our environments, and using it in a positive way and, and and getting it you know the students to understand as i say it's not a quick fix okay we're almost time's almost up are there any thoughts or comments or ideas that have been generated by this presentation there is a hand up fiona uh, yeah okay uh it's my hand mm -hmm. so i'm actually an instructional designer and mm -hmm. we are in the awkward position where we get graded on our accessibility Yes. Which means that um, the one lecturer or well subject matter expert we had said that she feels like we're spoon feeding our students. Uh -huh. um, but on the other hand, if we don't do it, we don't um, pass our quality assurance process. Mm -hmm. So we're stuck in a position of, um, I have to admit, our subject matter experts have found some really creative activities and mm -hmm. um, methods to bypass it so that the students do get some digital literacy skills, digital, okay. digital literacy skills or develop some of them. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that um, this is something that 
is particularly difficult for us to do. <laughs> okay, can you give me an example of what exactly what 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 is what's causing you know, causing the challenge here in terms of accessibility? Um, okay, I'm going to use our government's PDFs as an example. So this is legislation um, and documents outlining laws regarding to nursing. Those mm -hmm. documents are horrendously designed. <laughs> They're <laughs> very difficult. And we have to go and make them um, accessible to be um, read by digital devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which means that we upload all of these files for them into the course that they need to find. But it does mean that the students never develop the skill to go and find those articles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you there. Yes, it, it might be that, and it's what I was talking about in terms of information literacy. Um, it is important for them to try. Where, whereabouts do they find them? Do, is there a task that they could be assigned to go and find those documents? Is a specific, obviously, there's a specific place they can find them if they look for them. Um, that's the thing. There is actually a lot of different places that you have to go and mm. find the correct legislation documents, and they're not all in one place, which is. They should all be on the Department of Health's website, but they aren't. <laughs> oh dear, that doesn't help. But I mean, there again, you are developing that 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 literacy, that critical literacy of, and and also that that ability to actually you know pinpoint where these things are available. And, and it's a it's a very good example because it's clearly very difficult to find. So they have to go and go on a search. Maybe you can give them a few clues here and there, <laughs> but. I think it is good that it's impressed upon them how difficult it is to find these things. It's not just, again, you know, ask Google and it'll tell you. You have to actually go and do some investigation and you have to do it in the online environment. And there are different ways of, you know, looking for it. I mean, maybe you can, you know, introduce different types of search terms that you maybe have found that, you know, get, get, I don't know if that makes sense. Am I making sense in this particular respect? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. One of the ways that the subject matter expert in that specific scenario found um, to solve the issue was, she gave some resources of specific websites that gave good um, knowledge, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, and told yes. them they need to go find, use at least resources from this place in yes. your next assignment. And then yes. she graded their use of those, integrating those sources in answering the question. Okay. That um, sounds good. That sounds actually sounds very good. Yes. So mm -hmm. I find that these are some of the ways that our SMEs have made a specific activity related to finding information to answer a question and they actually grade them not just on the answer quality but mm. um on their source material and i think that assessment just incorporating it into assess one assessment already improves it no it does even something small as i say even something small even something as small as that it doesn't have to be some huge as I say, you know, um, longitudinal project. I mean, ultimately it will be, but I mean, just something, some little thing that will help the students develop that kind of literacy, and particularly around information and so forth and things like that. I think it's very, very, uh, that's a very good example, actually. And, and it doesn't have to be something spectacular, just something as small as that, identifying these different different sources and then having to, having to synthesize the information and, you know, finding out whether something is the right source or not. I'm hoping it's not some sort of summative assessment. I hope that is a formative assessment of some sort. No, it was a formative assessment. I don't know if it was one. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you. Okay, are there any other ideas, questions, comments? Okay, I think then we can bring it to a close. Thank you for, for attending. Um, I, I'm pretty excited about this is a subject around which I'm I'm really you know very keen and I'm also in the process of um, doing some research with a, one of my colleagues in terms of integrating all of this with academic literacy as well. So I'm, I'm it is pretty much a subject I'm very 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 keen on um, in terms of of using for teaching and learning you know and, and integrating it in that way. So thank you for your for coming and next week um, we will be looking at I just want to bring it up we could be looking at. Sorry, I've got too, too many windows open here talking about digital literacy. We will be looking at um, the aspects of digital communication, collaboration and participation. After that, on the 24th, looking at the ideas of, you know, the, the, the digital identity, you know, privacy, things like that, well-being, and then learning and development in terms of digital learning and digital teaching. Um, and then we're going to look at some prompt engineering on, at, in the last presentation in terms of the generative AI, which is 
very, very important. It's an important skill for, for all of us to develop, and, and, and it can be a good teaching tool for the students as well. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for today. It was a very interesting session. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Great.